I'm Stephen Jones. If you can see a picture, I'm the one waving to you at the moment. And we're uh, very pleased to have with us today Hannah Saraf, who's a specialist in risk management. The um, purpose of this is just thought leadership to spread ideas around, share ideas, get people's uh, opinions, comments, but the um, format is we have about an hour and therefore we'll have uh, a presentation. I'll introduce Hannah and then we'll have not a presentation, uh, more like a conversation uh, between the two of us. Uh, we've thought about some topics that uh, are appropriate to risk management and um, of course we're approaching Christmas. So greetings from snowy North Wales. Uh, Bangor is fortunately below the mountain level, so the snow being on the mountains, not down at our level. And wherever you are, whatever the time zone is for you, because I know there'll be people from around the world, um, season's greetings and uh, best wishes for uh, 2024, whether uh, you celebrate Christmas as a festival or not. There's lots to talk about, so I don't propose to uh, prolong the introduction other than to say we do this as part of our executive education um, dissemination of ideas thoughts in association with our two uh, flagship MBAs Chartered Banker MBA and Financial Crime and Compliance MBA and in addition we also have um, MBAs uh, sorry uh, short courses which pick up on the number of different flavours, including agility in organisations, etc. I've mentioned that we're coming up to Christmas. Christmas is a particularly challenging time for risk management. Unfortunately, uh, there are often increased attempts at fraud during the Christmas period, particularly with individuals. And there are challenges for organisations to make sure that their IT systems are resilient over a very busy period and a period when lots of people will be wanting to take leave. Uh, but people also want to to make use of IT. You don't want your IT crashing on you um, for your customers. Here we go. This is a little bit about me. I do look a little bit like the picture, uh, not hugely so. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details uh, about myself. It's about this conversation between Hannah and myself. Here's Hannah, though. Here's a bit more information about Hannah. S and he looks, yeah, he looks like his picture as well. So you can be sure that we are not avatars. We are the real thing. We're not put here by artificial intelligence or anything else. We're the real McCoy. He's a seasoned risk executive with over 25 years of experience. When we were preparing um, a couple of days ago for this session, uh, Hannah and I were talking about, you can see there, his journey, or at least some aspects of his journey, um, starting in the Bank of Ireland, then uh, Bank Med uh, out of uh, Lebanon, and then um, Starling Bank. One of the interesting things uh, there is moving from a very traditional bank, the Bank of Ireland, very heavily into bank branches historically and having to move, um, migrate as all organisations are to um, IT solutions uh, through the um, Bank Med, principally in um, Lebanon, but around uh, that region as well, and then to Starling Bank, which of course is branch less. And uh, risks change over time, even if uh, you maintain your one pattern of distribution. But here we've got an insight from someone who's been involved over changes in risk over time, uh, across geography and across different patterns of delivery. So you can see he's educated um, in, in France, École Supérieure de Sciences Économiques et Commerciales. Uh, I won't say anything more in French. That's my schoolboy French exploited to its full extent. Enough from me. Anna, very, uh, very warm welcome to you. We're looking forward to your words. Um, is there anything you'd like to say by way of setting the scene from your own background before we, we start with our first question? 
Thank you, Stephen. I, I think this is, um, I suppose, it's a great time to kind of stand back and reflect on how, as an industry, in terms of the banking industry, has evolved over the last decade and where, where we think, and maybe throughout this conversation, kind of probably paint that picture of where it might be heading towards over the next decade. So, and, and you know, some of us might start now thinking about, you know, could that be a straight linear path or is this going to be something else? Yes, indeed. And of course, um, we, we've just lived through uh, something which was non-linear, which was the unexpected event of COVID. So, um, and I set the scene there uh, for what may be our conclusion, which talks about a different type of agenda for risk management going forward. The thing to say is for you who are listening, uh, save your questions uh, to the end, but the but it's often useful, our experience uh, in the past is if you want to put um, any questions in the chat area, you can type the chat and then I'll go through them and pull them out, etc. And um, that will be the best way to do it. We're not going to interrupt uh, Hannah's flow, um, but type some questions and at the end there'll be time not only for me to relay those questions that you've typed, but also for you to ask questions directly of Hannah. Perhaps Hannah, the place to start is just to, if you're able to give us an overview of the types of risks that we ought to be thinking about, that organisations need to be thinking about. Sure. So I suppose, you know, in financial services industry in general and banking in particular, every company has its own inherent risk. So the, the very fact that we are in banking, we have what we call the inherent risk to the business model. We lend money, therefore, by default, we have credit risk. By default, we have operations, therefore, we have operational risks, things that could go wrong in either our processes or people or systems. If uh, we trade um, securities, um, if we you know, buy and sell shares, loan, uh, bonds and so forth, you know, we're, we're, we're exposed to market risk and so on. So these these kind of, we call them traditional risks, kind of, you know, the, the pillars in every business model, whether you're in banking or in asset management or insurance, these are the risks inherent to the business model, which we call the known known. We know we are going to, at some point, a customer will default on their uh, loan, and therefore, you know, we, we have to factor this in our business plan. It's it's a cost of doing business. It's part of, of being a bank. Um, and then over time, what you witness Different developments happen in uh, whether on the technology side or on the uh, regulatory side or on the economic side. So there, there will be different dynamics and different change and different evolution uh, across uh, various aspects uh, in the market, which influence either will amplify some of those inherent risks or will reduce them. You started, Stephen, by saying, you know, I started my career in traditional kind of conventional banking set up where you have a you know branch network to serve the customers. And then towards more recently in a bank which doesn't have any branch and it's fully digital, would you say the risks are different? The inherent risks are the same. We still have credit, market, operational risk, regulatory risk, compliance. These are all the inherent risks will be the same. However, the, the, the type and nature of risk tends to be more amplified if you are uh, in this, it, it depends on whether you are more digital uh, oriented or less digital oriented. If you're more digital oriented, which is the case of most of the challenger banks nowadays, then your non-financial risks, non risks tend to be more amplified in your risk register. So what you, know, you would be saying, if I'm looking at my risk register today, um, and if I'm a digital bank, cybersecurity risk could be your number one priority given that your uh, digital footprint is essentially how you serve your customers. And therefore, operational risk as a, as a domain itself, it could be more amplified rather than if you were, let's say, in a branch network environment where there you would still have operational risk but may not necessarily be uh, cyber related. So the, the, the nature of risks um, and the types of risks tend to be uh, either amplified or less depend on the the way you're deciding to structure your business model. So that's aspect number one. The aspect number two is, as you progress in your journey towards uh, growing and delivering your services to customers, then you, you are facing what we call the emerging risks, so things that you know they are there, but they're not quite sure how they're gonna impact your business model. 
And we've seen a lot of these emerging risks over the last uh, few years. Um, you know, we lived it, you know, we've gone through a global pandemic that wasn't on any risk officer's agenda or, or risk officer's register uh, back in 2020. Um, at the start of 2022, who would have predicted that there would be, you know, a, a war in, in, in Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine? At the start of this year, who would have put in the, on the risk register that one of the key risks is going to be, um, you know, a global failure of a big a systemically important bank in the US uh, and another one in Europe? None of us have predicted those events. Yet when they happen, they tend to be quite um, um you know, big in magnitude, and it will have some contagion impact on uh, ultimately the the industry, but also the business model of, of banking. So if you separate those two things, so there's inherent risks, they are by default, the known known, we know they are here because we are by the very nature of the business model, and there's the emerging risks that are known unknown, um, they are there, they should be on our radar, but we must at least categorize them as part of our risk register, risk universe, because they will have an implication on our business model. Example of these could be at the moment, we talk a lot about climate related, uh, climate -related risk or climate risk. That's one of those emerging risks. Uh, there are others like uh, sovereign risks, um, cyber risks still, we're not quite sure how it's gonna evolve with the um, advancements in technology. Uh, and therefore the types of risks um, that a risk officer will need to look at at any given point in time needs to be categorized in that lens. The inherent risk for which we have controls and we, we know very well and we know how to manage. And then you have the emerging risks for which we probably don't have much measurement tools for, but we need to recognize and assess as well as manage same way as our inherent risks. Great. Thanks for that very concise introduction. Uh, I particularly like the idea of the risk register and the risk universe. Uh, and of course, those uh, famous uh, sayings, there are the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and whatever Donald Rumsfeld decided where we don't know anything about anything, but we won't go into that. We're not here to talk about geopolitics. Other than, of course, uh, you mentioned that all banks, as we saw in the global financial crisis of uh, the 2007 eight were all connected and uh, very difficult to uh, sometimes to December uh, to differentiate uh, these things. I'd like to to talk a little bit more um, about we'll come to some of these other issues about cyber risk and of course it's it's important to talk about climate risk. COP is going on at the moment in the Middle East. Uh, they don't seem to at least the last time I looked, they hadn't reached an agreement this morning on a, on, on a statement. What about the risk from from human behaviour? The risk arising from human behaviour. I mentioned fraud uh, by criminal activities. That's one form of human behaviour. Um, uh, and we may later on pick up on something you said about cyber risk and things and where the technology can solve and capture some of these but about the risk arising from humans our our employees perhaps or is that reduced if if we're a uh, we're not a bank that has branches in the same way or we rely on on technology i don't think it's reduced at all in fact if anything um if you, if you try to analyze some of the events um in the banking turmoil early this year and when you look at what has happened really in, in the us uh, and then also uh, in Switzerland, and in, in terms of trying to understand what really drove those two major banks to um, to fail, um, there's lots and lots of analysis around you know the, the quantitative aspect of things, you know, in terms of assessing interest rate risk and liquidity and, and all these kind of things. But the fundamental common thread there between those organisations that have been pointed out is um, inappropriate or ineffective risk culture within the organization. And then if you try to, to think about what is risk culture here, well, uh, risk culture is, encompasses essentially the general awareness and behavior of all employees in an organization. And when we talk about the behavior here as a driver of culture, so the culture of accountability, of making sure that people understand and are accountable for their action, they understand their roles and responsibilities, um, they, there is an element of, um, respect for risk in terms of uh, risk management as a function within those organizations. 
So if you if you go and you know identify a specific issue or incident, uh, you are encouraged to report it, uh, not afraid of reporting it, um, and and so on and so forth. So there's an element of be human behavior within an organization at the committee level, at senior management level, at middle management level, at employee level, where where the question here is about what is general awareness and an understanding of risk management. Um, and therefore, that itself drives a specific behavior around risk mitigation and risk management within organization. Um, now, if that is the big but kind of big banner for 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 behavior. Then you have specific examples where you know you mentioned fraud, Stephen. Um, you know, at the moment, a very big topic is conduct, or you know, it could be staff misconduct, could be you know, conduct vis-a-vis -vis your customers, and and this is again driven by common sets of values uh, that that an organization is is abiding by, and they're trying to kind of to live by. And the one thing you put some, is some sets of words on a, on a page, uh, they look nice. But some other thing is to live those words and, and demonstrate that, that you are actually living those values. And this is where, you know, the, the behavior of an organization, you know, we all look, you know, look back at the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. And again, the same common thread appeared, which was, again, culture ineffective and therefore something must change to make sure that you know the behavior is is appropriate for what the outcome you're trying to deliver and once you set those values and sets of the desired set of behavior of an organization then you line up all your processes and people towards those value and then you can measure that you, you measure how good are we in delivering what we said we're going to deliver and, and with that hopefully if that is done in you know implemented effectively you should naturally start seeing less misconduct events, less um, you know uh, fraud events, less employee errors, less 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 of those elements that you would you wouldn't expect to see in a, in a very heavily regulated environment. I'm muted, so I was very quiet at that point. However, I noticed there's a comment in the chat area from Lawrence that says the volume is low. Um, now, Nick uh, and Seaned on our side are um, able to tell us. As far as you can hear, uh, Nick, is are we OK with volume? Yes, it Please sounds, check your it speakers. sounds good my end. Um, I'd suggest if the volume's low for anybody, if they can't adjust it on their computer or their headphones, that they log out and come back in again. That might uh, that might help. OK, thanks for that. So a variety of people, Lamin saying, uh, yeah, the volume's good. Performer saying, I'm good with the volume. Um, so uh, the, the suggestion, Lawrence, is that um, as with all forms of technology, if at first it doesn't succeed, go out and come back in. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, take a big stick to it. Uh, picking up on some of the things that you uh, you were saying there, um, and uh, it seems like we're building a framework around R's, the letter R. R is risk, R is regulation, R is role, is responsibility, is respect, etc. But over and above that, uh, that was really interesting about the idea of awareness and um, the understanding, because uh, have you read this particular uh, page of the staff handbook? Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, do you actually know what it means? Well, let's not go too far in these things. And uh, your characterization of of risk culture, uh, I think, uh, was uh, was very appropriate building on you can have a register uh, you can recognize the difference between um, inherent and emerging risks uh, but particularly with emerging risk when they come very quickly do you have the culture to be able to to respond and do all parts of the organization recognize it um, let's talk a, a little bit now perhaps about um, technology um, there's a strong debate uh, about uh, the benefits of technology. We've talked about some challenger banks who are essentially uh, technology banks. G 
given that you've just talked about risk culture, uh, and I have to say we hear stories about um, organisations where the boards of directors give perhaps mixed messages. They say to the compliance function, keep our name nice and clean. Well, we don't want it uh, in the press and we don't want to be fined and brand damage. And then to a different part, they say, well, go out and sell because, you know, we need to generate profits. And and that's problematic. You were talk we were talking about, we won't mention the names of them, but a bank in, in, in Switzerland, that's fairly obvious, uh, and a bank in uh, the US, that's a much bigger place. Uh, but I certainly heard stories about the bank in the US that for a period of several months didn't have a risk officer really in place, um, you know, what on earth are you doing with all these things happening around you and you don't have a risk officer? That's also, uh, well, I guess it's a part of the risk culture, etc. Exactly. Yeah, so what, what might we say if it's if human behaviour, um, the culture, can technology help us to try and manage this, this risk? Um, what about the idea that can humans be replaced by um, technological solutions to risk management? Yeah, I think, you know, every, everyone at the moment is going through this phase of um, technology transformation. And in particular, when you bring it home into the banking sector, we, we're trying to think about how are we going to use or utilize those advancements in technology to make our processes better and more efficient and serve our customers in a more, in a more effective way. Um, so I, I'd say over the last probably five to 10 years, um, there is there's essentially a common thread across all banks, um, particularly in UK and Europe, in terms of embarking on what we call a digital transformation journey. And digital transformation essentially take your branch network, okay, take your processes that are very rigid. Most of them are still manual. If you want to go and open a bank account, you know, over the last say ten years, you will phone your branch, uh, pick up an appointment, drive your car meet your branch manager, sign a few papers, come back home, wait for two or three days, and then you may get your account open. Whereas nowadays with the new technology, um, all, this, all this process of uh, you know, know your customer, onboarding, compliance checks, all of that can be done in real time. And therefore you could download your application or you can log into your mobile app and you know, fill in a few questions about yourself, upload your picture or passport picture, and then you have an account open in less than five minutes. So, so this is now a case study or, or a use case of a piece of technology that made a process that could take somewhere between three to five working days um, reduce into less than five minutes. So let's, let's, let's then, if you want to generalize this, you could see an, a, a definitely a benefit or an opportunity for uh, process efficiency, um, you know, utilizing those new tools and technologies um, helps automate some of those routine processes that we, you know, otherwise you would have to hire a lot of people to do some manual tasks. Now, all of that, or most of that can be automated, whether it's around documentation or around filing or, you know, anything that requires some repetitive um, uh, aspect to it, it can be automated through use of AI uh, or, or, or other tools. Um, but also the use of technology nowadays um, given that we live in a world surrounded by data, especially in the context of banking, you know, we have, we have, you know, we sit on mountains of data. This is about customer transactions, um, but not just around, the, you know, within the bank, outside the bank. If you look around macroeconomic data and other data, so applying those tools on vast volume of data can can have huge benefit for organizations, especially you know, we talked about fraud and, and cyber and, 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 you know, a few minutes ago. When, when you have a um, large volume of data and you apply those new artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, techniques on top of this data, you know, cases have shown that this can help um, um, improve the assessment and, and prediction of um, uh, cases for fraud and therefore help a, a bank minimize the risk of losses driven from fraud. So there, there's a lot of benefits out there. I suppose there's, you know, with, with any of those new changes, you know, with transformation calm risks, and every organization has to make sure that there's process in place to a identify those risks, but also make sure that uh, these can be, uh, you know, clearly uh, uh, 
assessed and mitigated. I can, you know, refer to the to the to the uh, point made earlier about amplification of existing inherent risks. So when you embark on digital transformation journey, you know, typically you will see um, new risks or, or or some of the risks amplified, such as cybersecurity risks, because now you're digitalizing more of your processes. There will be more opportunities for potentially cyber attack. Um, you more more or less are going to engage with a third party vendor along that journey it could be a cloud provider it could be uh, you know a, a market benchmark provider it could be a you know a core banking platform provider so now it's on you as an organization to make sure that the the resilience of that third party is is it's a sufficient level of satisfaction to allow you to rely on them and therefore there's no concentration risk in terms of single provider um, if they go down, then your business is affected. Um, and in addition to that, you would have your compliance issues in terms of, uh, you know, money laundering, um, uh, 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 you know, data protection, you know, making sure that the customer data is is, is secured. Um, so all of these are risks that it's not, they're not new, but they're amplified. And therefore, the question is asked about the existing traditional techniques to mitigate those risks, are they sufficient or do you need to do something else? Or do you need to add on top of those um, uh, mitigation tools to make sure that if you are on a technology uh, transformation journey, that, that you have sufficient controls in place to cope with the change risk that this journey is adding to the organization? Yes, I, I, well, as you were saying, going from um, three to five working days, which historically has been my own experience with bank accounts, to literally minutes, five minutes to open an account, that seemed like uh, largely to do with um, uh, operation and smoothing and speeding um, uh, the uh, process. Uh, and as you say, therein lies operational risk and the amplification, one example being um, operating through third party vendors. You may have as a company, uh, quite um, a well-developed risk culture as a bank, but uh, what about the um, same processes in your third-party vendors to avoid concentration? And there is a question we'll come back to in the chat area later that talks about um, the uh, factors or the techniques that can be used when existing traditional um, processes that cope with the three to five day rather plodding process gave us time to look at things. Now um, the bank uh, makes their decision literally within um, five minutes, as you were saying. I'd like to. You're on mute, I think, uh, Stephen. Have I been on mute uh, when I was speaking a minute ago? Let me repeat that. Uh, if it was worth repeating. Um, I was saying that you were talking about this transformation uh, from three to five working days to five minutes. And uh, my first thoughts were the operational uh, benefits, but also the operational risk, as you were saying, uh, and then amplified by this engaging with third party vendors who may actually lead to a concentration. And it's not necessarily your own uh, bank's um, tech technology that lets you down, but the, the concentration in these vendors. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the overall challenge in a very volatile environment where some things are traditional, inherent, as you called them. Others are emerging. Uh, we don't know when they're going to come along. We don't even know that they're going to come along. What that says about operational resilience, because uh, we mentioned a bank in Switzerland, one in the US, both of whom needed to be rescued. Those are the ones that are highly visible. There will be many others. What about operational resilience in a volatile environment? OK, I, I think operational resilience here uh, needs to be looked at in the, the broader strategic uh, context. Um, if you are an organization and you're aspiring to be resilient, uh, resilient against um, unexpected shocks, um, the, 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 the meaning of resilience here essentially is the ability of that organization to anticipate um, uh, those type of events, minimize their likelihood and or reduce their impact. Second, to make sure that um, they can mitigate the impact of the shock or to reduce the impact of the shock and 
thirdly, recover quickly from the shock, and then finally adapt to the new post-shock environment. So resiliency is in the context of um, unanticipated, unexpected stress event occurring to you. What are you going to do? Are you going to survive it or you're not going to survive it? Um, and then those four lens gives a good sense. If you are a bank or you're an asset manager, you're an insurance, uh, you look at the business model and then ask the question, to what extent those four dimensions um, are adequately covered. So the first dimension, ability to anticipate, what does that mean? I mean by this ability to predict, to forecast, to come up with different scenarios, to look at your horizon. You know what is your risk universe, you know what your inherent risk, your vulnerability as a business model, what is vulnerable to your business model, and therefore look at and look at the, the future um, uh, emerging risks uh, and then have a quick understanding of what is that going to do to my um, business model. Take the example of uh, climate risk. Is that going to threaten the viability or sustainability of your business model? If you tend to be concentrated on specific industries that are energy uh, intensive or you're lending to that industry, and then let's say this is going to be your, for sake of argument, your main loan portfolio composition, then, then, then you have a big risk here that needs to be looked at today, not to wait until you know specific transition risks event happen in the future. Secondly, it's once the shock happens and occurs, and those shocks will occur, um, you, you could do a lot to minimize their you know, uh, likelihood or, or an impact, but they will ultimately occur. And this is where this whole concept of operational resilience, assume something has happened. You know, don't waste your time coming up with the probability of it happening. Assume it's going to happen. Do you have enough financial and operational resources to uh, withstand the shock? And in the banking sector, when we talk about financial resources, we talk about essentially capital and liquidity. Um, and we've seen the example in the US uh, the last uh, few months where there was a big shock there and we noticed that the bank didn't have sufficient liquidity to cope with it. And so, so therefore, rather than wait until a shock happens and then try to figure out what to do and you know, we're going to sell some bonds at a discount and therefore it's going to be even more more costly and therefore it may not generate enough liquidity. It's now um, the time when things are relatively uh, stable to think about those stress events and try to capitalize for those stress events today such that if you go into a stress uh, situation, you would have sufficient liquidity buffer and capital buffer to cope with those situations. The third element to this is, okay, I, I was able to predict and I was able to, let's say, um, uh, withstand the shock, but that's, that's half of the equation. The next half is essentially, can you recover quickly your operations? Can you can you quickly uh, 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 generate um, uh, capital or liquidity? Uh, can you uh, recover your um, uh, operational uh, functions without disrupting your customers? And we've seen some of that operational resilience uh, activities during COVID, where we had all to shut down you know, the premises and, you know, ask all staff to work from home so without impacting the customer um, uh, services. So we didn't, you know, stop banking. We, you know, we continued the same way as it was, but in a slightly different setup. So to be able to do that, that means those banks have had to rehearse and develop very detailed uh, business continuity plans, as well as disaster recovery plans to make sure in case of those sort of scenarios, this is what we're going to do and this is how we recover our services. And then lastly is uh, if you recover, that's fine. But most of the time, and we've seen it in, you know, since the pandemic, is that those big shock events, they, they tend to be accompanied by structural shifts, uh, either, you know, in the economy or it could be in behavior. Uh, we've seen, for example, now, you know, the, the working from home or the hybrid working approach, uh, it, it, has, it has created a, a structural shift in, in that. So, so you know, you know, an organization needs to adapt to those type of shifts. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the aspect of making sure you have sufficient flexibility in your business model to adapt to the post-shock environment is another feature of resilience. So if you summarize it, there's even there are four elements to it is you know, ability to anticipate those shocks, predict forecast, you know, come up with all those scenarios to make sure you're prepared. Second, to absorb the shock. So you have sufficient resources to absorb those shocks. Thirdly, recover from it quickly. And then lastly, adapt to the new environment. And those organizations that manage to do those four um, 
uh, elements of resilience empirically have been proven to generate higher uh, 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 price to book uh, uh, market value uh, in terms of compare comparison with other organizations that haven't necessarily adapted yet to the new environment. Yes, those four four aspects of operational uh, resilience are, are very appropriate. Of course, the, in terms of uh, the new normal, as the, the terrible phrase is, what is the new normal? Well, the new normal is probably ongoing continuous change. The phrase from Alvin Toffler about the only constant is change is much used, uh, much hackneyed, and people go, yeah, yeah, we've heard that. But actually, the ideas of there's a long period of stability, then an event or a shock and another period of stability. Um, perhaps uh, those days uh, are behind us and we've got to expect greater number of uh, shock events um, and uh, shorter periods between them and to anticipate them, to absorb them, to recover quickly and to adapt that would seem to be the way forward. Perhaps as we come to, uh, what is it, uh, getting up for 40 minutes in, so we've got some time for questions. What does all of this mean for uh, a different kind of agenda for risk management? Uh, the agenda that builds on uh, a risk culture or um, that builds on understanding the risk universe that recognises uh, a register of risks and resilience, so many R's. Uh, what does it say for something beginning with A, the agenda? Is there a different agenda? Because we talked about the um, the traditional tools, the existing tools for, for responding may not be uh, appropriate. What about this agenda going forward for risk management? I think the agenda is, is definitely changing and evolving in the context of um, an age of continued uncertainty and change um, and disruption. So the traditional risk management and measurement tools that we used to have in the past, uh, they become necessary, but not sufficient to cope in this new environment or the new normal that we were going through at the moment. And by that, I mean the agenda is evolving and it's changing, in, I would say, in three major aspects. So one is the role of risk management in, in a bank is expanding to start thinking more about those known and known we talked about. It's all about assessing and managing those unidentified emerging risks. These are the big ticket risks that will threaten the viability and sustainability of business model. Managing and minimizing the known known, the inherent risk, that's in, in a way it's a hygiene factor. You have to do this anyway. This is part of your business. It's, you know, you, sh you know, this is kind of, it, you're by default, you need to be good at this. Uh, but looking at the, Emerging risks, the known unknown, um, these are the big ticket risks that could threaten the viability of business. And therefore, what risk management needs to do to influence that agenda? So by, by design, then the risk function becomes more strategic in nature. It becomes um, a partner um, you know, to discuss those type of um, uh, events and the implications of those events on the business. And they become a, a trusted partner to the CEO, to the board, in steering an organization, as well as making sure the organization remains resilient, as we discussed earlier. So that's one thread, and we're seeing more and more risk function having a, a, a bigger strategic role to play. Secondly, is the remit. So, the, you know, historically, risk management, maybe when it started back in the you know, 70s and 80s, it used to be, you know, a, a department. Of, 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 of let's say bank and that department most of the time was focused on credit risk and then Basel came along and said well what about market risk and then you know Basel 3 came along and what about liquidity risk and then we you know we started added more verticals more silos credit risk specialism and then market risk specialism and so forth and then over time we felt look these are all silos let's let's have a you know a layer that goes across those risks and we call it enterprise risk or integrated risk um, and that's all good and, and however, it's still that department sitting somewhere in head office doing some work. Uh, whereas nowadays, we're seeing more and more, given what's happening in the market, more and more um, role for the business to play in risk management. Now, we call them first line because they are the one originating the business. So therefore, they own the risk. And therefore, the first line of defense need to be fully aware about the risks they are taking. Uh, but also put the controls in place, making sure the controls are operational so that they can mitigate the risks they are originating. 
the second line of defense, which is the risk function itself, then has a, a bigger role in terms of oversight and challenge to make sure that the policies and the controls are operating as effective. And then, then there's this, this another term, we call it the third line of defense in, in, in a bank, which typically is the internal audit function to make sure that the framework is operating as it should. So there's, there's the risk therefore becomes an enterprise-wide responsibility. It's no more uh, the role of a department sitting somewhere in head office uh, doing some clever mathematics, but actually it is an enterprise-wide responsibility. All employees, all stakeholders have a role to play in identifying and managing risks. And this is back to the point about culture of risk awareness and a shared understanding of an organization risk appetite, as well as tolerance for risks. And the last aspect of that change, I would say, is the uh, enhanced capability. Uh, again, traditionally, we would have relied on whatever technology and tools was available to us to analyze data, to assess risk, to measure risk, um, and you know to report on risks. Uh, now, with the advancement in you know machine learning and, and AI, we can leverage all of that to help us get even better at identifying, assessing, and managing risks, and apply those to large volume of data to identify pattern trends um, and and. This, for example, you know, is, is now very, very uh, useful in the, in the space of fraud, for example, or, or money laundering, where machine learning techniques can help reduce false positives and making the the uh, you know the efficiency of fraud detection uh, more more relevant for an organization. Um, and then on the measurement side, the capability of the function has to kind of start thinking in a forward-looking. Uh, lens rather than backward looking. Again, historically, we would have loved to see lots and lots of historical data to, it, to allow us to model it or measure it. Uh, you know, back in the days, whoever could come up with a good value at risk model, which has 30 years worth of data, would say, look, I can give you with 99.9% .9 percentile confidence that that value is correct because I have the history to back it up. Nowadays, the history is no longer a good representation of the future because we know the future uh, may not necessarily uh, 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 be present in the past. So the, the example we've been through uh, recently, whether it's the banking turmoil, the energy crisis, the pandemic, uh, Brexit, you name it, didn't have historical data points to model. So, so, so therefore the measurement, because risk management is also about measurement and the way we're gonna model and measure risk has to change and it's becoming more scenario-based approach. We set the scenario and we stress test the balance sheet and the PNL to determine the most likely outcome and then with that we can start looking at how do we uh, then take actions whether on uh, the, the the financial health of our organization and soundness but also around uh, compliance conduct and operations wow so uh, the the theme of ours continues the role uh, the strategic role of risk management the the remit of of uh, risk management, uh, as you say, um, starting out very much in silos and then a cross cutting theme, but this this enterprise wide responsibility uh, and uh, recognizing doesn't actually begin with an R, though we could probably find one. Looking forwards, uh, not looking backwards, because um, we can't rely on having had the data uh, to be able to have certainty about these things. This challenge of scenario. Uh, based planning. One final thought is for banks that already exist, uh, indeed it's not only banking is it, this approach to risk management applies to all industries to a greater or lesser extent. Um, uh, this idea of a, an appetite for risk, a culture for risk. What uh, do you think there might be resistance within organisations, within particular parts of organisations to the uh, the, the approach that you've developed during our conversation, which seems eminently suitable, looking forward, not backwards. Are there going to be any uh, resistances? Can uh, regulators mandate that um, organisations uh, follow this idea of, uh, of risk management? I, I think, again, as a risk um, a management function in an, an organisation, and, and talking about banking in particular, um, you have multiple stakeholders here that have interest in risk, right? So at, if, you, if you kind of take those two group of agents, you have the regulator uh, who are mainly concerned about financial stability and, you know, financial soundness and health of organization at the same time, making sure the depositors are protected. 
the other uh, kind of group of stakeholders, uh, they are you know, typically looking at risk from the lens of an investment opportunity. So think about shareholders or investors or rating agencies trying to see, is this company viable? Is this going to generate sufficient return? And is it going to be profitable? And I, I think the role of risk management is it has evolved and it's continued to evolve to ultimately make sure that you, you, you have a balance between managing those sets of stakeholders. You can, of course, deliver the resilience agenda, which is making sure you're sound, robust, and you know you can withstand shocks and recover from it and adapt. That's that's great, and it, it kind of delivers that robustness and resiliency, as well as solvency mandate of an organization, which is again it plays on the regulatory agenda. But equally important, a bank needs to be profitable, and to be profitable, um, I think you said something earlier, Stephen, about you know you know shall I send off my my you know loan officer to generate business and come back and therefore who's making sure that this business is is prudent and is it within risk appetite and this is where the the other angle for risk management you know we're not against you know uh, making you know profitability but we need to make sure this profitability is sustainable and it's on a risk adjusted basis so the resistance your question you know do you face resistance as long as you meet those two equally important objectives and you show the stakeholders that your role is essentially enabling resiliency, but at the same time, generating sufficient uh, risk-adjusted profitability to allow an organization to be viable in the short term, but also sustainable in the long term, right? That itself um, is going to be the mandate. And so far, if this is the sort of elements that people will be looking at you to deliver. And uh, if, you, if you manage to deliver this sort of balancing act between resilience and economic efficiency, I think that would be the, the single success factor of banks uh, are looking to kind of uh, uh, operating in a sustainable sustainable way over the long term. Great. And uh, the, the spectrum that you've just talked about is profitability with prudence. It sounds like it could be the name for uh, or, or the, the slogan for a bank. Thanks for all of that. Uh, now let's have a look at some of the questions now i'll go through them uh, you can still put questions in the chat at the area uh, lots of people are saying the volume's low okay um who's this now comfort asked about um you mentioned in passing um sovereign risk um do you want to say a little bit about sovereign risk we talked about yeah. that i think in our preparations yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think sovereign risk, um, I, I mentioned about emerging risk and uh, big ticket risk that could potentially threaten viability and sustainability of the business model. Think about sovereign risk. If you think about it, all banks are exposed, whether you know domestically or from a foreign perspective, they are exposed to uh, the sovereign risk in terms of investing in either sovereign bonds or placing their uh, uh, deposits in central banks. And the question really is, now, if you're in, in the AAA rated sovereign, probably you have nothing to worry about uh, or maybe little to worry about. Whereas if you are in some emerging markets or developing economies where domestic banks are heavily exposed to their sovereign, you know, there you would see, you tend to see more than 50% of the balance sheet exposed to, to the sovereign. Then any, any change in the um, credit worthiness or the perception of credit worthiness of that sovereign will have direct impact on the banking sector because there's, there's a high correlation between sovereign risk and bank default risk. And therefore, um, the question I've been asked recently, so what do you do as a risk manager? Because you know you cannot control the sovereign. You don't know, you, you don't control you know, public finances and, and you know, the, the, the economic health of, uh, and, and the government sort of uh, plans, all of that. But as an organization, we're living in that economy. There are certain things you could do, measures that help you diversify the risk measures that help you um, assess uh, and, and capitalize and put some buffers to allow you to withstand potential sovereign distress in the future. Um, but at the same time, come up with what we call those uh, recovery plans and identify those measures that allow you, in case you are going through a sovereign debt crisis, uh, that you have the tools and you have identified them, you will execute them to allow you to quickly recover the uh, viability and restore viability of their organization. Sub so sovereign risk is a, is a topic very relevant at the moment in emerging markets and developing markets where uh, most of the rating agency would, would rate uh, the, the sovereign uh, 
um, somewhere on, you know, along the line of the non-investment grade. And therefore, any change in rating of the sovereign could trigger a domino effect, mostly around, uh, it would put pressure mostly around liquidity for those banks. Okay, thanks for that. And then there are a couple of questions around the um, subject of, uh, of technology, which I think um, you, you've covered uh, uh, quite a lot about um, um, technology. Somebody asks, uh, Patrick asks about um, um, mitigating risks and things, and uh, your your framework talks about, well, uh, um, anticipate, recognize them, um, uh, absorb, uh, recover quickly, etc. So I think you've talked about that. Uh, and then um, Adaisy talks about this uh, moving away from the face-to-face -face traditional banking, where um, the proposition is that you could easily profile a new customer, moving into uh, this process that you've described of moving from three to five days to five minutes, really. Um, and Adaisy says the risks are enormous. Yes, indeed. Uh, there's a disconnect between the customers and the banks resulting in failing due diligence. Customer due diligence, know your customer as we know it, and uh, as you characterized it, uh, Hannah, uh, of course, becomes even more important. Um, and I think you talked about uh, the volume of data that we have that might allow us to look at due diligence on customers from a number of different angles, which previously would have been quite perhaps a laborious uh, process, etc. Is there a chance that we might drown in too much data or, or is technology there to process such large volumes of data uh, that uh, volume and information overload is less of a problem for us? Yeah, I, I think just to make, to make sure that, the, you know, for, for this question, what we're not, we're not saying that um, we are compromising aspects of the due diligence process. In fact, we're we're no, adding no. even more robustness on top of it by using technologies and tools that allow us to do things that we were not able to do before, given that, you know, uh, capacity in, in, in processing power wasn't there. So, so you're absolutely right, Stephen. There's more data points that you can bring into the process by applying those signals. So, for example, if I'm a, you know, a new customer to the bank and I you know fill in the questionnaire and then you know, I apply for a, a current account. Uh, opening procedure. What is happening in the background, my details have been used then and connect with at least half a dozen other service providers. It could be credit bureau, it could be you know a fraud bureau, it could be whatever, try to see if my name matches their databases to, to pull out information from various data sources, as well as um, looking at my uh, digital um, uploading of picture, photos of passport. Um, nowadays, they have different authentication tools, could be face, uh, voice recognition. All these new technologies, when you, when you put them all together, the accuracy of ultimately detecting a uh, fraudulent account is quite good. In fact, it's actually more performing if you were to compare it with traditional uh, tools that we used to rely on in the past. So, um, there is definitely no no compromise in the, in the in the due diligence, but in fact, what is what is happening here is is just speeding up the process and make it more efficient and more by by more automating some aspects that used to be more manual and repetitive. Okay, thanks for that. And um, I like uh, I'm not sure if it's a question or, or yes, it's it's, it's partly am amplifying something that you said, Hannah. Uh, Jire uh, talks about. Uh, I'll go to the bottom of his of his con of the contribution and then come back. And uh, uh, I think uh, the suggestion is that banks, bankers uh, are like uh, meerkats in the wild uh, who I think they're the animals who put their head up and they're looking around all the time uh, to see what's happening. And they have some uh, interesting way of signaling to other members of the I don't know, are they a pack of meerkats? I'm not quite sure. Um, makes their response to emerging threats so effective. Now, of course, meerkats are presumably responding to whatever eats a meerkat. I'm not quite sure. It could be a lion or a tiger uh, or along those lines. And uh, Jire talks about um, this idea 
is continuous horizon scanning to detect environmental changes early. And, and to an extent, you've said that, except, of course, there are some things that you can scan all you like. You wouldn't have thought about uh, COVID, although supposedly there was a movie some some years ago, etc. And organisation wide standardisation of, of detection, Jire says. Um, early warning signs, limits, tripwire mechanisms. Uh, other than commenting on the meerkat uh, suggestion, Hannah, uh, any thoughts on, on Jire's view? I, I fully agree. Uh, the early warning systems uh, are, are absolutely key. You remember when we, meant, when we talked about the uh, anticipation capabilities, this is called to that. To what extent we have truly early warning. When we say early warning system, it has to give you early warning. It cannot be based on backward looking metrics. Um, no. So therefore, it has to be by 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 design leading indicators. So this is where the 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 you know the, the difficult part is you know what are those leading indicators? If they do materialize, they give me sufficient time to act before the risk actually materializes. Um, your your point about uh, the pandemic, you know, was was there any indicator or not? In fact, those of us risk officers, and I know quite a few who went to their boards. Um, a few years before the pandemic, I put on the key risk register, uh, risk of global pandemic. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to tell you what the response they got uh, during that meeting, because this is, the, this is the other issue you're facing. So let's say, um, you know, one thing is not to detect those events. Another thing, having detected them, try to convince your stakeholders that actually it's going to happen. And if it does happen, this is the impact of it. So therefore, you know, as risk officers, you have this kind of, you have that challenge to make sure, um, A, you are detect depicting the right patterns, um, B, um, the focus, and you've seen the UK on the operational resilience side, is no more about the likelihood of something happening, because that's that's just wasted energy. You know, assume at some point something's going to happen and it's going to be like this. Now talk to me about how are you going to recover? And that becomes more, it shifts the focus really on preparing yourself to dealing with the event rather than spending time trying to model how, how likely it's going to be. OK, and then thanks for that. Um, a number of people who uh, have thanked for the for the presentation. And of course, I extend my thanks for that. And then um, who's this here? Uh, Ravaka says, um, thoughtful risk management, a clarification between uh, inherent, uh, traditional and technology risk. Um, I think the thing you've just said uh, a couple of minutes ago in answer to the last question is um, it's not so much about we have to manage the um, the uh, the traditional risks that we've had that are inherent to our activities. Maybe we refer to those using a word you used earlier, hygiene. We just have to be very good at those. Um, and in terms of coming up with uh, spending a lot of time calculating probabilities, we probably can't attach a probability, but there's a good chance that something may come along, as you were saying with your example of um, uh, banks, uh, boards who uh, just said, global pandemic? No, I don't <laughs> think so. Wooshka, in it comes from the left field. So, um, there we are. I think that's a good time for us uh, to uh, draw things to a close, to thank Hannah for a very interesting um, whistle-stop tour of risk management in the 21st century, uh, how to prepare for it, and uh, to continue to focus on profitability, because most banks are yeah, for-profit organisations, but do it with prudence. Um, enjoyed the presentation. A number of people say and informative would like more of this, says uh, Tricia. Whether that's more of risk management or uh, more of this general theme, we do have a number of these um, uh, webcasts on, on a regular basis. Pop into those and um, we also have opportunities both in our talk programmes and uh, through um, short courses to look at the topic of risk management. Let me just uh, see where the slides are so that uh, I can move the slide on. Or Shona, perhaps you can just move the slide on to show the detail. I can't find the slide here at the moment, I don't think. 
Hello, Seanad, are you there? Yeah, OK. Can we just move the... Uh, there we go. OK, I think it's coming up. Great, OK, that's the first slide. And the one that says... Here we are. This is the one that says, if you want to uh, find out more about what we're doing, uh, by me, all means, please come and join us in um, our webcast on a regular basis. But there are a number of uh, formal avenues for your continuing professional development that would lead to uh, qualifications. Our Chartered Banker MBA, our Financial Crime and Compliance MBA. You could study single modules. We also offer short courses. This is a hot topic. If it's of interest to you, uh, get in touch there. Bangor.ac.uk forward slash executive education. Let us know of your interest. And we hope to see you soon, either on a formal programme leading to a qualification or on a short course. It remains for me to thank Hannah for uh, this fantastic insight, fascinating for me, um, and uh, for emphasising so many R's, not forgetting culture. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks to Thanks everyone you. for attending. Thank you so much. Yes, thank bye bye you. now. Bye bye.